Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the December meeting for our Essex Metro Immunization Coalition. Uh, amidst the pandemic and the impending snowstorm, I'm happy to uh, have you all here. And I think we have a very um, good lineup of speakers today. It should be a very interesting meeting. Um, so to start with, uh, I'd like everybody should have got, received a copy of the minutes in their email. So if you could take a copy, a chance to uh, review those, and we'll take the motion as well as the um, uh, vote within the chat. So uh, during the meeting, you can um, uh, send your vote in if approve or disapprove, or if you have any amendments or corrections for the minutes, please put those into the chat. Emily Haynes will be monitoring that and um, we'll have the final vote by the end of the meeting. Um, this meeting is being recorded. So if anyone wants to view it again on the uh, partnerships website, you can as well as invite uh, your colleagues or friends to view it too, if you find the information helpful. So again, welcome and uh, happy holidays as well for the upcoming holidays. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Schwab. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily Haynes, and I'm the Director of Public Health Initiatives at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey. Thank you for joining us today for our uh, the last Essex Metro Immunization Coalition of the Year um, meeting of the year. And uh, it's been a very exciting week for vaccines and uh, we have a lot of exciting programs to talk about today. And uh, the first presenter will be Daria McClam. She is the uh, program coordinator for the Power to Protect New Jersey flu campaign. And uh, she will be presenting some updates on flu vaccination in New Jersey, um, as well as some updates on the Power to Protect NJ campaign. So Daria, I will pull up your slides and you can let me know when it's time to advance. Thank you so much, Emily, uh, for that introduction. Again, my name is Darren McClam, and I'm the program coordinator for the Partnerships Influenza Campaign. Um, I will be talking to you today about some updates within the action group and um, some COVID and flu updates as well. Next slide, please. So the New Jersey Department of Health has an update regarding COVID-19. There is a designated uh, webpage for COVID-19 related information. And it also has an executive summary. Uh, so the link is on the screen and you can also access that um, to learn more information by just visiting the Department of Health's uh, webpage to get more information. Next, page, next slide, please. So on the screen here, there's two charts on the slide and it represents the number of flu doses ordered and shipped for the VFC and 317 programs. It provides a comparison um, from last year's flu season to this year's flu season to date. Um, so a little background uh, for those who don't know, the VFC program is a federally funded program and it provides vaccines at no cost to children who might not otherwise be vaccinated because of the inability to pay. Uh, now the 317 program is a federally funded program that provides vaccines at no cost uh, to adults who might not otherwise, otherwise be vaccinated because of the inability to pay. So the chart on the right shows an increase in adult flu doses ordered and shipped with the 317 program in comparison to last year. So this is really great um, to see this increase in the amount that was both ordered and shipped um, to date this year. Uh, and on the, the left hand side of the screen, this is the uh, VFC program. So there was a decrease in the pediatric doses ordered and shipped with the VFC program. However, I just want to highlight that we're still in this flu season um, this year, and we can easily bring these numbers up to meet um, last year's uh, numbers, and we might even surpass it. So it's just important for us all as public health organizations and members of the public health community to just continue to promote um, that children six months and older to, uh, still need a flu vaccine 
even if they aren't attending school this year due to the pandemic, um, I really, we really do believe that these numbers can be surpassed from last year, especially since we are, um, you know, in the flu season this year currently, and we're almost um, at the number that we ordered and shipped um, last year. Um, and I just want to emphasize that the Power to Protect New Jersey campaign has a ton of shareables and videos available, um, some from pediatricians that can help emphasize this messaging and make it easier for you to promote um, flu vaccination for this age group. Next slide, please. So this is the NJIIS flu report. Um, this covers both pediatric and adults. It's, uh, this chart displays the number of flu doses administered in NJIIS for both pediatric and adult populations. Um, on, you can see that there were 925,072 flu doses documented in NJIIS last flu season. And to date, there are 744,139 flu doses documented in NJIIS for this flu season. Um, so this is really great to see. It's really, um, this is really a positive thing. Uh, we can easily surpass last year's flu, um, flu doses administered if we just continue to uh, work as a collective and promote the flu vaccine and educating um, the population of New Jersey. You see these numbers are really close, almost almost close to each other, and we're midway through the uh, flu season, or not even so. So we have the capacity and ability to surpass last year's numbers. We just have to do our part and continue to promote um, and, and share messages, positive messages about the flu vaccine. Next slide, please. So although the National Influenza Week was last week, I just wanted to highlight this messaging still. Um, these are some of the wonderful shareables that we do have available on the Power to Protect New Jersey website. Um, there are, these are just a few of them. We have some that says myself and my baby, um, Power to Protect my community, um, my family, those I care for. Um, these are available on the Power to Protect New Jersey website, as well as uh, the videos that you can also use and download to share to your audience to increase and promote um, the messaging for flu. Next slide. So I just wanna give some updates within the Power to Protect New Jersey campaign. Um, so the action group itself, we now have 143 member organizations. Some of our latest organizations that have joined have been the New Jersey Immunization Network, New Jersey Perinatal Associates, Montclair State University, as well as the City of Elizabeth and uh, Health and Human Services. So these are uh, the newest members of the action group. And I just wanna uh, say thank you to everyone who has joined the action group and has shared um, the action group with other organizations to get them to join on as well. We are still growing and we do still encourage all to, um, if, you're not, if you're not part of the action group, to, to join so that you can be a part of the meetings that we, that we have to get flu updates um, and just be a part of a community that um, encourages and promotes the flu, flu uh, messaging. And then um, I also wanna highlight some of our top tweeters for the campaign. So we do have hashtags, two hashtags that we use, Power to Protect New Jersey, as well as Fight the Flu New Jersey. Um, and some of our top tweeters as of um, the end of November were New Jersey Transit, New Jersey Department of Health, New Jersey Health Qual Healthcare Quality Initiative, as well as Greater Newark Healthcare Coalition. So these are the tweeters that have been using the uh, hashtags um, and promoting the flu campaign on Twitter. We do see everyone promoting it on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, we do encourage you all to continue to do that. Um, you know, we're greater in number and uh, the more we tweet, the more we uh, post on Instagram, the greater impact we'll have and we can increase those numbers that we saw on the last screen. Um, and then I also wanna just highlight that we have been getting a lot of flu clinic events submitted on our website, which is wonderful. It's very informative for the population. Um, it, it's easier for them to see where events are happening, where they can go to get their flu shot or educational events that are happening. And some of our latest, um, so though, some of our latest organizations that have submitted events have been Ocean County Health Department, Sioux Falls Health Center, St. Joseph's Health and Violent Health Department. So we wanna continue everyone to continue to submit those events so that we can keep everyone posted on our website and on our social media pages. Next slide, please. Um, so speaking of events, um, for those who don't know, this is a snippet from our website. Um, the tab events is on the right hand side. So if you click on that events tab, you can easily sub submit an event uh, via that page. It, it's very self-explanatory. You can just select if you're submitting a flu clinic or flu um, education event. 
Um, and then there isn't a section for attachments or flyers. However, feel free to, to email those directly to me and I will make sure that they're added onto the website um, so the flyer can go along with the event. Next page. So this is the social shareables that I mentioned earlier. Um, we do have a social shareables uh, tab on our website. If you click on this tab, um, a bunch of our sh social shareables will come up in English. However, if you scroll down a little, you are able to click the down tab where it says, please select language. And we do have other languages available for those shareables. So the shareables will automatically update to the languages on the screen. We have Arabic, Chinese, Creole, and Spanish available and the shareables automatically change into those languages and make it easy for you to download and share with your um, target audience. Next slide. And we also have videos um, available for use on our website. If you go to the videos tab, which is right next to the social shareables tab, the video screen will pop up with all of our Power to Protect New Jersey campaign videos. We have pediatricians, we have members of daycare facilities, uh, we have a personal story um, with a mom, whose child had um, flu, had flu at a young age and how she was able to get through it. Um, so we do have a lot of videos on our videos webpage on our website. And this is just showing you how you can translate the videos into a different language. So if you click on the video itself, it'll take you directly to the YouTube page for the Power to Protect New Jersey campaign. And from there, you'll see a little, a little wheel. Um, you click that, subtitles come up, and then you click the subtitles tab, can change it to the English subtitle. Once you change it to the English subtitle, it'll revert you back to the first screen, which you will see in step three. Uh, next slide, please. In step four, uh, once you click that English auto-generated again, it'll say auto-translate, and immediately after, it'll pop. Uh, a bunch of languages will pop up, and once you select the language that you wish, the subtitles will then appear in that specific language that you wish. Um, to see on the screen. So it's easy to change the language and get the video in the language that you, um, that the population you serve would better understand. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, again, next slide, please. You can feel free to email me directly and I'll be more than happy to assist you with any questions you have within the campaign um, or the shareable to videos. If you have troubles, you can feel free to reach out to me or if you wanna join the action group yourself or know of a member organization that would like to join, feel free to email me or pass my email along. Thank you so much, Emily. Great, thank you so much, Daria. And um, again, if you have any questions about the Power to Protect New Jersey flu campaign, please um, feel free to reach out to Daria and um, she will get you uh, the information about joining the action group if it's something that you'd like to do. And we also have those monthly meetings that offer updates about flu vaccine um, in New Jersey. Uh, and the next one will be in Jan early January. So now I'd like to introduce Teresa Rowe. She is the New Jersey Immuni Immunization Information System trainer and recruiter. In, um, at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health. And she is going to walk us through some updates on NJIIS and um, COVID-19 vaccine enrollments and some updates there and resources that um, New, the New Jersey Immunization Information System and the partnership have been uh, working on to um, help with the COVID-19 vaccine rollout. So Teresa, welcome. And we're seeing Hi. your screen, so thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Emily. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa Rowe, and I am a trainer and recruiter for the New Jersey Immunization Information System, also known as NJIIS. I am from the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, and the counties that I cover are Essex, Union, Morris, and Warren counties. It is my job to assure that providers like yourselves are using the immunization registry uh, properly for vaccines within your office. If, you're off, if your site would like to administer the COVID-19 vaccine, you will, will be required to register for the NJIIS. To register for NJIIS, you must first go to the website njiis.nj.gov and locate it on the right side of the homepage as you see in front of you is the orange COVID-19 enrollment tab. 
select the orange tab that says COVID-19 enrollment. And it will take you to the page that says COVID enrollment inf uh, information. And if your site is not currently a NJIIS facility, what you will do is click this link here to submit the COVID-19 new facility enrollment form. And, um, and that will allow you to gain access to NJIIS. Once your form is processed, you will receive an email for your next steps in the COVID-19 enrollment process. And once you receive your NJIIS username and password, you will need to log on and complete the required CDC COVID-19 form. Please be aware that new and existing NJIIS facilities will need to complete the CDC COVID-19 form when logging into NJIIS. All staff entering COVID-19 data into NJIIS are required to take the on-demand COVID-19 webinar, which is found here and on this link. Everyone entering data into NJIS will need their own username and password, so please do not share your username and password with others. To get a username and password, enter each user's information into the COVID-19 enrollment form, which can be found here on this link. And all you have to do there is click, the, click on the link and fill in your information. The training must be taken in full in order to complete access to, uh, in order to get complete access and to be able to order the COVID-19 vaccine once it's made available. So once you complete your registration, the webinar will begin and you must allow yourself one hour and 10 minutes to complete the webinar. And once again, you must view the webinar in its entirety in order to gain complete access and to be able to order your COVID-19 vaccines once they're made available. If you have any questions for the New Jersey Department of Health, um, there are some things that are happening. Um, one thing that I have uh, came across was that the, uh, they have developed a Vax Matters newsletter um, and that letter will be updated weekly. Questions about that, uh, any questions you have for the CDC about COVID-19 uh, as well as NJIIS, you have the option to participate in the office hours that take place every Monday and Wednesday from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. and they answer all questions about the registry, about the enrollment process. You can also, um, well, uh, before I go there, you can actually register for office hours through the GoToWebinar application by clicking on this link here. Okay, and any further questions that you may have, you can also go to submit a request for questions about the NJIIS registry or about the enrollments or training process. Thank you. There you go, thank you. So um, again, my name is Emily Haynes. I'm the Director of Public Health Initiatives at The Partnership. And I'm just going to take a few minutes to uh, walk you through one of the new uh, projects that we've been working on in our immunization program at The Partnership. Um, it is a maternal immunization education project called Two Protects Two. Next slide, please. So this project uh, is funded by an unrestricted educational grant from GlaxoSmithKline to the partnership and as well as Families Fighting Flu, which is a national nonprofit organization that advocates for uh, flu vaccination and um, also helps families who, um, who have lost a loved one or um, who have a loved one who has suffered from complications from flu. So uh, we partnered with them and our objective was to develop culturally sensitive patient educational materials to promote pertussis and flu vaccination during pregnancy um, in both English and Spanish. And we developed digital and printed materials that will be distributed to OBGYN offices and prenatal clinics throughout New Jersey, um, specifically Northern New Jersey, but um, we also uh, could distribute outside of our region as well as nationally through the digital downloads that are available. Next slide. 
So we, we do see that maternal immunization rates continue to be an area um, of focus to improve because only about 50% of pregnant women will receive the recommended vaccines during pregnancy. And uh, maternal immunization, especially for pertussis, is very important because that is really the best protection that we can give our most vulnerable infants um, to pertussis. Uh, we, you know, infants do not receive their first dose of pertussis vaccination until they're two months of age, and most hospitalizations and deaths from pertussis occur in that zero to two month age group. So that maternal immunization is very important. And for flu vaccine, again, that will protect both the mom and the baby, um, providing some antibodies and protection from flu until the baby's able to receive their own um, flu vaccination at six months of age. Flu vaccine during pregnancy also reduces the mother's risk of hospitalization for flu by 40%. So that's also a really important thing we want pregnant moms to know is that they're at high risk for complications from flu. Next slide, please. So as part of this initiative, the Partnership and Families Fighting Flu hosted three virtual focus groups back in October. Um, we held one group for moms whose primary language was is Spanish, um, one group for moms whose primary language is English, and one group for nursing professionals and midwives working with pregnant women. So they received a gift card incentive, and we held one-hour sessions with each of these groups and asked them a series of open-ended questions about their, um, their perspective on maternal vaccines and also showed them some educational materials and stock photography to get the, a feel for, you know, what, what do they think of current materials that were available and how could we maybe improve those? Next slide, please. So just I, I'm just going to quickly go through some of the themes that came out of the focus groups, and then I will show you the materials that we developed um, as a result. So um, from the Spanish speaking moms group, um, we you know just broke down the baby's age. All of the moms that participated had children that were less than 12 months of age. Um, you know, we had a range of participants as far as if they had one child or several children. And most of the participants had an OBGYN as their prenatal provider. Um, for the Spanish speaking group, we did have a little bit of an older group, the 30 to 40 um, range, age range, uh, when compared to the English group, our English speaking moms group was a little bit um, younger on the younger side. So next slide, please. So these were some themes that came out of it. Um, so definitely we heard safety concerns. They were concerned that vaccines might harm their baby or give the baby viruses if they received them while they were pregnant. Um, they were interested in learning about vaccines through brochures at their OBGYN office. And they had this idea that whatever you put in your body will pass on to your baby. So that was actually a reason that they wanted to get vaccinated. They, they kind of understood that um, I, concept of passive immunity. They also had um, a general consensus that if the mom was could stay healthy during her pregnancy, then that would mean that the baby would be healthy. So, um, you know, if we could show that vaccines were a way for the mom to stay healthy, then that would be a benefit for the baby. And their healthcare provider was their biggest source of influence on their decision to vaccinate. Um, in both groups, we saw that their feelings about their discussion on vaccines with their providers was that their doctor recommended it. Uh, mostly they gave them a flyer or a brochure, but they never explained why they should be getting vaccinated. They didn't get into a conversation about it. Next slide, please. And then in the English speaking moms group, um, you know, again, all of the moms were uh, moms of children under the age of 12 months. Uh, more, more of these moms only had one child, and they're, again, mostly seen OBGYNs as their prenatal provider. 100% um, of these participants were between the ages of 22 to 30. So it was a little bit of a younger group compared with our Spanish-speaking moms group. Um, we definitely saw more uh, myths come out in this group. So the idea that you would get a flu, get the flu from the flu shot, um, you know, 
that there um, were concerns about vaccine ingredients, um, that vaccines weren't safe. And also it was really interesting. We had a few moms that um, had high risk pregnancies for multiples and um, they viewed getting vaccinated during pregnancy as an additional risk factor. So they thought if you had a high risk pregnancy, you shouldn't get vaccines, um, which is you know, the opposite. You would want um, those patients to get vaccinated so that they um, could lower their risk for flu complications. So they, they did see vaccines during pregnancy as protective and adding an extra layer of protection. So it was kind of a bonus protection. Um, and they also talked about listening to podcasts, doing some online research, and um, some actually said that they went to the CDC website, which was encouraging. Their greatest influence on their decision to vaccinate was the doctor's recommendation, as well as family members and doing their own research. So this group was more likely to go online and try to find information for themselves. They felt the same about the conversations with their providers. They didn't feel as though they had got an explanation as to why they should be getting vaccinated during pregnancy. And these moms um, really liked more detailed information on pamphlets. And we saw that in both groups for the moms that they wanted to know more information. So they liked the more detailed. Um, and then we also held that professional uh, focus group for nurses nurse, and nurse midwives. And you can see the variety of practice settings that were represented, um, different age groups and different years of practice. Next slide, please. So um, with this group, you know, again, they reinforce that the questions that they hear most often included safety concerns about vaccine ingredients. So that was a theme across all three groups. Um, they did use vaccine information statements, CDC website, and patient portal materials for educating patients on vaccines. And they had concerns that the health literacy levels were too high on a lot of the materials. Um, so they liked the more simpler materials. And um, again, these CDC, New Jersey Department of Health and World Health Organization were where they felt as though um, they received more information about making recommendations for pregnant patients. Um, it was really interesting. We had a variety of, you know, recommendation strengths within this group as, as far as their own perspective on the recommendation. So um, a lot of the nursing professionals actually said that they didn't want to alienate their patients by talking about vaccines too much. Um, they were a little bit worried about seeming aggressive if they recommended vaccines too strongly to pregnant patients. So um, there, were a little, there was a little hesitancy there to talk about it. Next slide, please. Um, most, most of these uh, nursing professionals kind of rated themselves as like pro-vaccine, um, but then others felt that they were pro-vaccine, but um, the patients already come in with their decision made and they don't, they shouldn't have to talk about it with the patients. So uh, we, you know, they encouraged pregnant patients to receive thimerosal free vaccines at their OB provider office, which was interesting because I, you know, felt as though that kind of reinforced um, concerns that the patient might have about safety of vaccine ingredients. So, um, and then there was also a concern of over vaccinating patients for tetanus by providing a Tdap with every pregnancy. So they, they wanted a pertussis vaccine that was separate. Um, okay, next slide, please. So our lessons learned was that moms generally want to know more about vaccine ingredients and have a conversation with their prenatal providers about their concerns. Providers are concerned that they'll alienate their patients if they're seen as recommending too aggressively. And patients want more detailed materials with realistic depictions of moms and protecting mom and baby was a key benefit of vaccinating both in both moms groups. Next slide. So um, with this information, we developed the Two Protects Two campaign, and this is available both in print and digitally. Um, all of the materials are available in English and Spanish, and we've um, had the materials reviewed by physicians. And you actually can contact the Partnership for Distribution. We have a distribution order form 
Um, so you can, you know, choose your quantity of um, materials of each type that you want and each language, and um, we'll have them shipped directly to your site. So next slide, please. So this is an example of the display flyer. So this is a, an eight and a half by 11 uh, material that is available again in both English and Spanish. And the three things that we really touched on are that vaccines are recommended, vaccines are effective, and vaccines are safe. To touch on those concerns about vaccine ingredients. And also the idea that, you know, if you, if you have mild um, side effects after receiving a vaccine, it doesn't mean that you're sick, that that, that is your immune system. Um, working to develop antibodies. And, you know, with COVID-19 vaccination especially, I think that's an important thing that we'll need to teach um, the public about is that, you know, if you do experience, um, you know, some mild side effects after, particularly after the second dose, which was observed in the clinical trials, um, that doesn't mean that you're sick, it, you know, it, or that the vaccine made you sick. Um, it means that your immune system is actually doing what it's supposed to do. So. We tried to include that message on our materials as well. Next slide, please. These are the postcards. So they're double-sided. So the top is the um, front version of each and the bottom is the back version. So again, all of these are available in both English and Spanish. So we wanted to make sure that everybody had options about you know, what images they wanted to use and which language they would want to use for their client um, base and patient base. And then we also developed a bookmark, which is a little bit more simplified and smaller um, size. And we kept it very simple um, for, you know, when vaccines are recommended on the front and then on the back, just a little bit of information about um, the benefits for mom and baby. So these are the materials that were developed. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's it. So, um, those are the materials that are developed. And again, you can order those through the partnership and they'll also be available on our website for digital download. So now, Monica, if you're still in control of the slides, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lisa Gittens Williams um, from New Jersey Medical School. She is the professor, a professor at the Division of Maternal Fetal Medicine and Director of Obstetrical Services. And she will be presenting on vaccine acceptance during the pandemic. And if you have any questions for the presenters, you can ask them in the chat or the question box and we can address them um, at the end of the meeting or as we go along. Can you see the slides? Great. I can. And uh, Dr. Gittens is, um, she's not sharing her webcam, but she is uh, on audio, so we should be able to hear her. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me to talk about this topic. I'm really excited about um, the educational programs that are on ongoing and actually quite timely. So I'd like to talk to you today about the patterns of vaccine acceptance um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And to pre preface this, I can say that when the pandemic started and we, we filtered over to telehealth, we were concerned that our patients were not coming to clinic as regularly and that we would miss opportunities to immunize them, at least at the time um, for Tdap. And even in the postpartum period, as we were discharging patients home early, we were concerned that they would not get their postpartum um, immunizations. And as the COVID pandemic surged, we were concerned that the upcoming, in the upcoming influenza season where we are now, there would be a problem with patients accepting vaccines. We thought that there might be fear about vaccines and illness and accessing the healthcare system in general. And then we took our foundation from what we learned about pediatric immunizations, which were going down during the pandemic because patients were not accessing healthcare. So that began to frame our thoughts about this problem. Next slide, please. So our typical recommendations for immunization during pregnancy and postpartum are as follows. We would administer a Tdap vaccine to all pregnant women, 27 to 36 weeks gestation, 
Um, and that would be with each pregnancy. And if they have never had a TDA vaccine, then we would administer it immediately postpartum. Our protocol is to administer flu vaccines to all eligible patients annually um, with each flu season. For HPV vaccine, we started a novel postpartum HPV vaccination program, which I'll further explain. And the HPV vaccine series can be initiated postpartum or when breastfeeding. The recommendations are to administer to age 26. And so the postpartum period creates a great opportunity for that catch-up vaccine in those populations who have not received prior HPV vaccine. And also using shared decision-making, HPV can be administered to patients age 27 to 45. We would administer rubella vaccines to those patients who are rubella non-immune, um, and that can be um, given postpartum or when breastfeeding. Hepatitis B can be given in certain populations when necessary, and varicella as well as rubella both can be given postpartum. Next slide. So when we thought about what would be some of the reasons why um, patients might not continue to take their vaccines um, during the pandemic, we looked for this social and socioecologic message and framing, things that influence patients' acceptance of, in fact, influenza Im immunization. And we understood that a lot of the vaccine acceptance depends on the provider recommendation. The odds ratio for that is really strong from this 2014 study. And we also knew that when you use a hospital-based practice as the primary source of prenatal care, that actually increases the rate of immunization. And that might just be because hospitals have the opportunity to protocol things out. And if the patient perceives that she has a interpersonal support for the immunization, that can also increase the immunization rate. But we also knew that there was, again, continued during the pandemic, concern for access to the healthcare system, and then maybe some healthcare avoidance. And those things um, framed our hypothesis. Next slide. So we also knew that we had some challenges. And this study um, from 2013 suggests that African-American patients tend to avoid vaccines and have a lower immunization rate, and they may have lack of information on their safety. And then regarding HPV, we also knew from the adolescent literature, um, immunization of adolescents, that mothers might have been hesitant to immunize their daughters because they thought that it might increase their cause unsafe sexual behavior. Next slide. So what is the case for the postpartum HPV vaccination? Um, in this particular study by um, Juden and Liberite in 2015, they found that race, ethnicity, and income were factors for acceptance and use. And so to frame our thought, we, we looked at the cervical cancer rates as cervical cancer being the most common GYN cancer in the United States. Its incidence and mortality in blacks is higher compared to whites. Um, the rates and the locations of high rates of um, cervical cancer depend on poverty levels. So there are higher rates of cervical cancer when the poverty rate is over 20%. And we also knew that HPV um, you know, causes most cervical cancers. So um, in spite of the recommendations to immunize, there are not, there's not a very high rate of immunization series started and completed in adolescent females. And then we also knew that you know, black patients are diverse, and so vaccine acceptance is actually even different within ethnic groups. So particularly in Caribbean and Haitian patients, there may be different um, reasons why vaccines are not accepted. Next slide. So we thought about this HPV postpartum program because there is no contraindication to HPV during the postpartum period or lactation. And there's not any reported risk for unintended pregnancy after the administration of an HPV vaccine. And we thought that the postpartum period is a time when the patient has longitudinal involvement with the healthcare system. And in fact, during this time, she might also have increased health insurance coverage. And so we thought that there would be a, a good time to implement this. And also the postpartum period provides a great opportunity to continue education. So we wanted to capitalize on the opportunity to um, talk about immunizations during the postpartum period. Next slide. And so uh, another study that guided us was that this study of provider acceptance of postpartum 
HPV immunization programs. It came out of the UT Galveston in 2016. And they offered the HPV vaccine postpartum and also at their well baby visits. And then they assessed um, the provider acceptance. So this study um, didn't actually look at immunization outcomes, but they looked at provider acceptance. And they found that um, the providers did seem to very well accept this. The providers saw that cancer prevention was the main benefit, but they felt that the woman's perception might influence her acceptance. And they, the providers actually felt that education of the patient was critically important to their ability to accept this intervention. Next slide. And so postpartum HPV vaccine is actually very, um, currently being very well studied. And in fact, there's there's a clinical trial under clinicaltrials.gov at the University of Alabama um, where they're trying to enroll patients and they want to look at the acceptability, the uptake, and the immunogenicity of the vaccine. So that is one thing that has not been studied, although the vaccine is safe to give, next slide, in the postpartum period, and there are no um, untoward outcomes related to the administration of HPV vaccine in the postpartum period. There is the concern that pregnancy is an altered immune state and is the immunogenicity of the vaccine the same? And so that is actually being studied right now. And so our postpartum immunization program at um, 2000 at University Hospital um, started in 2015 and we put an EMR prompt into the medical record that actually brings the immunization record into all of our prenatal and postpartum notes. And so, whereas most EMRs may have a folder where you can go see the immunization record, we wanted to eliminate that extra step. So we put a prompt into our progress notes for postpartum and our clinic visits that pulls the immunization in, making it very easy for the provider to see whether or not a patient has received or not received a vaccine. And then all immunizations that are administered in the healthcare system actually would flow into this immunization record. So we have a uniform um, immunization record across the entire healthcare system. A provider order is necessary to administer Tdap. And so at every encounter, all patients are assessed for the um, presence or absence of documented immunization to either Tdap or HPV or rubella or influenza. And then the resident faculty team would counsel the patient about any immunization that would be indicated. A language line is used for all encounters when the provider does not speak the primary language fluently. And that is just a key part of our typical practice. And I do believe that it led to our high immunization rates, which you'll see later. And then when immunization is indicated, an order is placed by the resident. The nurse provides a vaccine sheet. She further counsels and then administers the vaccine. And then administration of a, a given vaccine is either declined or accepted. And that is documented in the electronic medical record. Next slide. So this study, um, as I will unfold it to you, um, it sought to analyze the effect of the COVID vaccine pandemic on immunization rates. But during the time frame that the pandemic um, was ongoing, we, you know, we did not. It was not on, in influenza season, so we don't have any of the information about influenza. But we thought that it could inform us about upcoming the upcoming influenza season, and we thought that if we could demonstrate and maintain high rates and high counseling about immunizations, we would then be able to meet the challenge of the upcoming influenza season. Next slide. So um, again, this is some nationally reported acceptance rates of, of Tdap, and you can see you know, from the green over the course of time, the antenatal um, administration of Tdap is, is, has been increasing. Next slide. And so um, this, the goal of this study, this was done by one of our maternal fetal medicine fellows, um, Kyla Christian Morphy. And the, the goal was to evaluate um, the acceptance of immunizations during the pandemic. We wanted to see if the immunization rates um, would be maintained. And we looked at the pre-COVID pre -COVID time and then during the COVID pandemic. We did a retrospective cohort study from March 21st to May 31st. Um, and we, so we compare 2019, the pre-pandemic period, to 2020, um, the current pandemic period. We looked at all patients um, who were delivered at University Hospital, and we looked at their acceptance of, of HPV, Tdap, MMR, varicella, and we also looked at whether or not they immunized their neonate, um, because during that time, we noticed that there was also some concern 
about neonatal um, immunization. And as patients um, cross state lines and would want wanted to deliver um, in New Jersey as opposed to New York, when New York had certain visitor restrictions, we were receiving patients who were declining um, neonatal immunizations. So we chose to, in fact, study that as well. Next slide. So these are the results of our study. Um, the average age of our patient were 28 years old, but they ranged from you know 6.35 to 6.67 um, years in age. But between 19, 2019 and 2020, the actual maternal age was not different. Um, the parity between the two, the number of babies that they had had previously was about the same. The gestational age, they were mostly delivered between 37 and 38 weeks, and most of the patients in our study had a singleton pregnancy. They had about the same number of prenatal visits, um, which was seven. Um, that was before the pandemic and after the pandemic, the average number of prenatal visits was about the same. When we looked at the insurance status, you can see here um, from the boxes that a large percentage of the patients were Medicaid, um, but about 24 to 25% approximately had charity care, and there was a percentage of patients that were uninsured. Privately insured patients were actually very few. And the um, non-English speaking patients was about um, 35% in both the pandemic and um, in the pre-pandemic time, and ethnicity, 47% of the patients were black, 41% were, were Hispanic, and 8% um, were white. Next slide. And so when we looked at our um, vaccine um, immunization and acceptance rates, we noticed the following. Um, in the pandemic time, our rate of antenatal um, Tdap increased. So pre-pandemic, our rate was 36.9%, and then the post-pandemic, in the pandemic period, our rate was 60.2%. Our HPV vaccination rates were really unchanged. We were able to maintain a high rate of HPV vaccination in the postpartum period, and that was up to um, 80%. So it was 80% before the pandemic, 79% after the pandemic. And for the neonatal acceptance of vaccines, um, it was unchanged. 99.2% of patients accepted um, neonatal immunization and 98.9 um, in the pandemic period. And so, um, and then the rates of other vaccinations as they were indicated like MMR and Varivax, um, which we would offer to patients who were non-immune to those vaccines, that was actually also um, maintained. Next slide. So our conclusions and recommendations are we were able to um, maintain a really high rate of um, HPV vaccines in this um, postpartum immunization program. Um, we thought that the um, postpartum period is an effective way to start HPV vaccination series in patients who have not had earlier administration or to catch up on those who we see that were documented having had only one or two doses. Um, we did notice that we had fewer deliveries during the pandemic, but that is an experience that was happening at all of the birthing hospitals in the city of Newark. Um, but we did maintain um, vaccine immunization patterns throughout the pandemic. And that may have been also because we, we were stressing to patients that immunizations are important in the COVID-19 pandemic because we didn't want them to get sick from other things like COVID. Next slide. So um, subsequent to um, us doing this study, this other study came out, um, and this is a 2020 study, where um, the, the researchers described a postpartum HPV vaccine, vaccination program for low-income women. So they did something very similar to um, what we did. They just published it before we did. But um, their goal was to increase vaccine uptake in women who did not complete their series. And so they administered the post the HPV vaccine postpartum, but also at well child visits. And they started a program where they text messaged them and they used their patient navigators to assist with their appointments. They achieved a vaccine um, immunization rate somewhere between um, 70 and 80% for the most part. And they found that Hispanic patients were more likely to complete the series um, than black patients. And they found that if you miss a, an appointment, that was associated with a higher likelihood of not um, completing the series. Next slide. 
So we feel that there are opportunities, um, particularly using community partners, including faith-based organizations for education about the continuance and the importance of maternal um, immunizations, um, as did the last um, reference researchers. Well baby visits may be an opportunity um, for maternal immunizations. It depends on how the practice is set up. That is not something that um, we have investigated, but as we continue to look at our rates of completion of the HPV vaccine series, um, we'll see if well baby visits are an opportunity for maternal immunization. Those well baby visits could be also an opportunity for maternal immunization in moms who don't accept the influenza vaccine, because we do see moms that are um, not accepting the influenza vaccine um, during pregnancy and maybe in the immediate postpartum period, but we might be able to catch them later. We're working on scheduling vaccine visits so that the patient has all of these visits ahead of time. The electronic medical record and um, the patient portals allow us to really move robustly through this situation. And so that has likely also increased our opportunity and our success with immunization. We need to understand better factors that are associated with vaccine concerns in varying populations, because again, it's not um, the same for every population and different populations have different concerns and they have different understandings and maybe myths or misunderstandings about immunization. And um, we also think that our 100% use of translation lines as necessary um, really led to our success. So um, that is about our immunization program. There's some references there um, that you could you can take a look at. Um, if there is, since there is um, still some time, is there still time? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so then I'll go back to my slides. So um, this is really hot off the press because you may have seen that the first COVID vaccine was given here at University Hospital. Um, and immediately as it is being um, administered to our employees, and frontline workers, so healthcare workers and other frontline workers, um, the question became, should pregnant women receive COVID vac vaccinations? And so very similar to um, what we had to do when the pandemic started and we had to develop protocols for taking care of pregnant women and how we were going to isolate them and whether they were going to breastfeed and, and developing protocols and going to um, our societies for guidance, um, we we had to come up with what we would recommend for pregnant women. And I mean, this is really important because although the vaccine is not necessarily available to a large group of pregnant women, there are those pregnant women that are healthcare workers. There are those pregnant women that are frontline workers and we needed to be able to give them guidance. And so this guidance is today's guidance. And so I would say that tomorrow this will change. And as another vaccine comes out, this will change. This is actually yesterday's guidance. Um, but this is the kind of information that we thought that we would talk to them about. So I just wanted to share this with you so you'd have some idea for um, pregnant women. Next slide. So what to tell pregnant women. So, you know, pr pregnant women who are frontline workers may be really worried about, should I get the COVID-19 vaccine? And so we start by telling them that the vaccine um, had the trials in breastfeeding and pregnant women have not been completed. And women don't really understand that that doesn't mean that it's not safe or it wasn't safe to give. They just have to understand that clinical trials are, the, that pregnant women and lactating women are, and children are special populations and they're typically not first in these types of vaccine trials. And so then we have to talk to them about their options and they can either get the vaccine as soon as it's available or they can wait for more information about pregnancy. Next slide. And so we talked to them about what are the benefits of getting the COVID um, vaccine. And we expressed that pregnant women are much more likely if they get COVID to end up in the ICU and to end up on a ventilator than are patients who are not pregnant and who have COVID. And we also explained to them the, the clear data that there's an increased risk of preterm birth for pregnant women who have severe COVID, but other obstetrical complications such as stillbirth don't appear to be increased. But we definitely explained to them about the risk of preterm birth. And then we know we also know that there's an increased mortality. So the COVID mortality for pregnant women is higher than for non-pregnant women who are the same age. And then we give them the general data about at least the vaccine, and I think this is related to um, the Pfizer vaccine, because this is yesterday's data, is that it will prevent 95% of COVID infection. Next slide. 
So then we tell them what the vaccine won't do. And this is pretty important because um, you know, I've had patients even tell me that swabbing their nose for the, the COVID test will give them COVID. So we have to let them know that the COVID vaccine will not give you COVID because it doesn't have a live virus, at least the, the vaccine that we're speaking about today. And it doesn't contain any ingredients that are supposedly harmful to pregnant women or to the fetus. And then we express that multiple vaccines are given during pregnancy and that are safe and that we continue to encourage. And that would be te tetanus, diphtheria, and influenza. Next slide. And so then we talk about, you know, what are the risks? So the risks are that, of course, the vaccine has not been studied, and we provide the data on how the vaccine has been studied. The cohorts that were studied had no serious side effects, but again, we reiterate that it was not done, it was not tested in, in pregnant women. And then we talk about the routine side effects of vaccines, like inject, injection site soreness and fatigue and headache maybe myalgia, chills, and joint pain. And we talk about the 1% that might have a, a high fever and that high fever in pregnancy is a cause for concern and that they should seek um, provider, their healthcare provider attention if they have a high fever. Next slide. Okay, well, what if the person doesn't know, um, what, they, what don't they know about pregnancy? Um, we know that COVID is really dangerous and we know that the Pfizer vaccine is recommended for persons 16 or older. And even though there are no pregnant women studies, we know it's a new drug, but there isn't any particular concern with this vaccine. So as we talk to pregnant women about it, we, we must talk to them about what their actual risks are, or what their perceived risks are. Next slide. So what do the experts say? The so Society for Maternal Fetal Re Medicine strongly recommends that pregnant individuals have access to COVID vaccine, and they recommend that that patients have a discussion with their health care provider about their own personal choice, and that would take into account their own personal risk. But they do recommend that um, pregnant women have access to the vaccine. And then also the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology recommends that it should not be withheld from individuals who meet criteria for vaccination. So that means that as organizations roll out their immunization program um, for, for example, employees or frontline workers, that they don't withhold the vaccine from pregnant women. They don't make the pregnant women get a note from their doctor, um, but that they encourage the women to have a discussion with their healthcare provider and that the vaccines not be withheld. Next slide. So what can help the patient decide? You know, I will tell a patient to think about her own individual risks, her exposure, who her close contact is, does she have family members who are in and out um, of the house? Or does she have family members? Is she living in a, a multi-generational um, multi home where protecting others are important? Um, is she able to wear a mask all the time and social distance? And then additionally, does she have diabetes? Um, is she in a minority group? Is she obese? And of course, is she a frontline worker? And of course, pregnancy creates its own risk. But those are the things that can help someone decide. Um, many patients may decide to forego getting the vaccine um, during pregnancy, but then they might consider getting it postpartum. Um, and then that speaks to whether or not you can take the vaccine when you're lactating. Next slide. So what about breastfeeding? The Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine reports that there's no reason to believe that the vaccine affects the safety of breast milk. Um, it's typical to other vaccines, um, you make an antibody and antibody Bodies do protect into breast milk, but since the vaccine doesn't contain the virus, there's no risk of breast milk containing the virus. Now, I would be concerned about patients who would decide not to breastfeed because they were getting the virus, the, the vaccine, because, you know, the benefits of breastfeeding are so great. And so that is something that we will have to weigh and talk carefully to patients who um, are deciding about breastfeeding and getting the vaccine, particularly those frontline workers um, right now who will be first to get the vaccine. Next. So in summary, um, COVID causes more harm in pregnant women um, than in women of the same age who are not pregnant, including rates of death, higher rates of death, and pregnant women are much more higher risk to be in the ICU or be intubated um, if they do get COVID. The risk of getting um, the COVID vaccine are thought to be small, but they're really not known. So we do have to give that information and we would advise the person to consider their own um, personal risk. And if their risk of risk is high or there are many cases of COVID in their community, then it may make sense for them to get the vaccine while pregnant. 
Um, so that's the kind of counseling that we would do for this. I'm sure that there'll be many organizations that will come up with similar types of summary statements, um, and those can be used to frame um, educating patients. I think that it's important right now to start talking about um, COVID vaccine to women um, as they will have the opportunity, whether they're pregnant or not, to immunize themselves and their families as um, larger populations of, for immunization become available. But thank you. So does anyone have any questions about that? Thanks, Dr. Gittins. This is uh, Joe Schwab speaking. Uh, that was a really wonderful presentation, a lot of information. Um, I'm very happy to see the uh, kind of growing interest in vaccines, which has been for years now, growing in, in OBGYN. And I think it does a lot to support our efforts, both in protecting the newborn children through that transfer of antibodies from the mother, as well as setting the tone for um, the families to be accepting of vaccines and to seek vaccination um, in the babies, beginning in the nursery with the hep B dose and then after that. Um, and your information on COVID really was very helpful to all of us as we're really beginning to start to think about um, these vaccines um, as they're becoming available. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful talk. Yeah, thank you uh, for inviting me. I don't know if there's any questions coming through in the chat for Dr. Gittins. Uh, hi, hi, Dr. Gittins. This is Emily. We do have a, a question. Um, are you vaccinating on site at your practice or do you refer your patients out for vaccines? So the program at University Hospital is currently related to um, healthcare workers and, and frontline workers here. So if um, we have a patient that is currently working here and if she is, has access to the vaccine and wants it, we would provide her with that counseling and then she would go to get the vaccine here on site. Um, if patients are um, working elsewhere where they are have frontline access to the vaccine, we would appropriately counsel them and they would get that vaccine there. Um, I, I'm hoping that, and, and Dr. Schwab might an, an, answer this question, um, as we were talking about what our protocols were for pregnancy, we were hoping that they would collect information on whether or not the recipient was pregnant. Um, but I don't know that there's a, um, an initiative to do that, but that could provide later downstream data. Um, and so I think it would be unfortunate if they didn't collect information about whether or not they, Im whether they immunize someone who was pregnant, just even just to get acceptance rates. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's very important. I don't know if they're, I don't think they're doing it right now, but since we're at the very beginning, that might be something we should uh, push for to have that information collected if it's at all possible to do it, because um, uh, it would be very informative. Agree. Thank you. And another question, um, Dr. Gittins, uh, for flu vaccine uptake, oh, let me share my webcam. Um, for flu vaccine uptake, uh, you said that uh, you were you were not able to track the flu vaccine um, during that particular study because of the timing of it, but you hope that it would kind of give some uh, some uh, perspective into uh, this flu season. Now that we're in the flu season, are you seeing similar trends, do you think, within your patient population for flu vaccination? Are they more or less likely to accept flu vaccine, um, you know, during this pandemic? I think our framing is very important. And so, um, again, we, fr we, are, we have been framing the acceptance of the flu vaccine to avoid the emergency room, to avoid coming in with a low-grade fever, and to avoid being triaged even for influenza. And so I really haven't seen thus far, typically every influenza season, it might be the mask wearing as we talk about, but typically in most influenza seasons, I see a lot of triage in emergency room patients for a uh, rule-out influenza. I really haven't seen any patients for rule-out influenza. Um, 
this season, very few, where we've gone to the emergency room or had a triage pregnant patient for flu. So it may be related to the immunization, it may be related to the mask wearing. Um, I do think that there is a high uptake of influenza vaccine this season, and it has to do with how we're framing it, and we're framing it in the face of COVID. Thank you. Just yeah, and we've 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 seen the same in pediatrics, where there's there's really a higher uptake of uh, accepting the vaccine, um, and we haven't been seeing as much as many cases as well. So. That's good. I I don't think our health systems could take take any flu um, and increase flu activity at this point. So <laughs> we need to keep promoting prevention. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gittens, for your presentation. It was really wonderful, and I'm glad that you were able to share the COVID information as well. So thank you. Um, Monica, I think now we're moving on to uh, Kendra's presentation. Um, just an, an update on the EMIC Community Education Working Group. So Kendra? Okay, so this is Kendra Julian. She is the Adolescent Immunization Specialist at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health. And Kendra, you just need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. We were hearing you and then you you went out, Kendra. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh. All right, good. All right, great. Hi everyone, again, my name is Kendra Julian and I am the Adolescent Immunization Specialist at the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey. Um, today I will be giving you a brief overview about our education working group call um, but for those of, who, those of you who are new to this call, um, before I do so, the purpose of our education working group call is to discuss the immunization edu education working group opportunities and to discuss any future immunization education events. So for um, some of our HPV education, um, what I've been doing is um, I've been outreaching to um, colleges and universities, and this quarter I... Um, distributed 150 educational resource bags um, to the colleges and universities in the area. So Keene, Essex, Keene University, Essex County College, and William Patterson University each reach, um, received, I'm sorry, 50 bags. Um, in the bags, um, we had included uh, flu brochures, um, a brochure from, um, HPV brochure from Merck, and a stress ball, and those bags were distributed to the students um, on campus. Um, I also outreach to the provider, pediatric provider offices, middle and high schools in, in the eight northern counties of New Jersey. Um, 146 middle and high schools were outreached via email. I shared the HCV program um, with each school, and I also shared our upcoming 2021 Protect Me 3 campaign. 60 provider offices were also outreached via email and phone calls. Um, I shared resources about HPV, the CDC vaccination guidance, and a link where the providers can register and access on-demand webinar um, recordings such as NGIS reminder recall um, tutorial and an HPV vaccination tool tutorial. Then there was some virtual education. Um, my colleague, uh, Melinda and I created educational home videos about Tdap, flu, and meningitis. Um, these home videos were created for the schools, the high school and middle schools, as a way to increase awareness. Um, currently, right now, um, I'm still in the editing process for, for two of the videos, but once the videos are all complete, they will be um, shared on YouTube so you can review. Um, there was also some HPV workshop for the high school students and parents. I collaborated with Snyder High School in Jersey City, and I educated their freshman health classes. Um, there were a total, total of 36 students that were educated about the importance of HPV and the vaccine. 
Um, and I will also be educating in the next week or so um, Lincoln High School in Jersey City as well, um, also their health classes as, as well. I also educated 36 parents in total um, via virtual um, about um, the importance of the HPV vaccine for adolescents. Um, some of the um, um, organizations that I educated um, were uh, Turning Point Rehab, um, uh, Rehab Center, um, Garfield Coalition, and the Disease Prevention Coalition. Then the education um, working group call, um, we discussed um, hosting some immunization weekly social media live sessions. We had a total of four live sessions. Um, the first session, uh, Jennifer Smith from the Jersey Department of Health, um, she, um, I went on live with her and I did a Q&A about flu, the importance of flu. Um, this live took, took place on our partnership Facebook Live. Um, she discussed the importance of flu and why we should get the flu vaccine. We had a total of 180 views. My colleague Melinda and I hosted an HPV Live on IG for students. Um, and we had a total of 50 views. This, that IG Live can be, I'm sorry, that, that uh, live can be found on um, our EMIC and partnership um, Instagram page. Antoinette, um, Dr. Antoinette francis from Robert Wood Johnson, um, we also um, hosted an HPV Live um, on our Facebook partnership page. Um, addressing parents' concerns about HPV and the vaccine, and that had a total of 131 views combined. And then lastly, um, Dr. Everett Schlum, um, family doctor, um, we hosted a Facebook Live about pneumococcal vaccine. He addressed a little bit of the flu and COVID. Um, that can also be found on our partnership Facebook page, and that had a total of 137 views. So these um, working groups, um, I, ho I, I host them um, twice for the quarter. Um, if you are interested in taking part in the education working group call, um, call um, please let me know or um, you can send Emily an email and I can um, add you to our next working group um, uh, email list. Um, the next call will be in January. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kendra. Um, any questions for Kendra, you can put in the chat or questions box. Um, Monica, do you mind advancing just the one more slide? There we go. Okay, so um, for our community education working group updates for EMIC, um, just to, uh, again, announce the Protect Me With 3 Plus contest is open for submissions. And in the handouts today of this meeting, you have a flyer for the contest, and uh, submissions are being accepted through January 24th. So that is open to all middle and high school students throughout New Jersey to participate by submitting either a video or a poster about uh, recommended vaccines uh, for adolescents. And uh, we are accepting digital submissions, so uh, everything can be done virtually. And uh, this is a great project for middle and high school students to do um, at, while they're at home if they're doing some virtual learning. Um, for SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, we talked about, you know, vaccine messaging, building trust. Um, we also um, are collaborating with Rutgers and other organizations on uh, community conversations for uh, COVID vaccine and COVID-19. So those handouts for those focus group uh, events are also in your handouts today. So there's a flyer in English and a flyer in Spanish, and eligible participants can uh, call the number on that flyer to learn more and to sign up to participate and lend their perspective. And then we um, received our updates from Teresa Rowe, NJIS trainer and recruiter, uh, earlier in the meeting today, but we also are continuing to work with NJIS um, staff to um, promote COVID-19 enrollment for providers and to provide resources as we roll out the COVID vaccine. So um, as far as EMIC membership goes, we are increasing our social media following that has been um, increasing steadily throughout the, since the pandemic started really. And um, as we 
develop more content and we're we're hosting more events like the ones that Kendra shared, the live Q and A sessions. We're really um, getting a lot of views on our materials and we're able to reach parents and students um, and just community members directly. So that has been uh, very successful and you can look at our social media pages on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook if you um, haven't already. We have over 300 newsletter subscribers and 110 active members. So if you're on the call today and you'd like to join the coalition, just um, send us an email. You can email um, myself or info at partnershipmch.org. Say that you'd like to join the coalition and you'll be added to the list and you'll make uh, we'll make sure that you receive all of the monthly newsletter updates and resources that are available for our coalition members. Um, next slide. Okay, so we have about five minutes left. If you have any updates from your organizations um, to share with the coalition members, you can put those in the chat box and um, send a message out to all of the members about any updates or programs that you're working on. And uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Schwab to close the meeting. Okay, <clears throat> thanks, Emily. Uh, I think we had a very good meeting today. I hope everybody um, found it informative as well as uh, stimulating uh, for our activities in terms of uh, trying to increase immunization, which is our, our main goal for this coalition. Um, in addition to the chat, you can also send updates through to Emily through email uh, regarding upcoming events, as well as questions and comments that you might have. So, uh, so I would like to uh, close the meeting. Uh, I thank everybody for your time and attending. I hope everyone stays safe with the, uh, again, the upcoming storm, as well as this uh, ongoing pandemic. And we wish you all the best for the uh, holidays and in the new year that 2021 will uh, bring us both more success in our endeavors as well as uh, healthier and happier times. So all the best to all of you. And um, I look forward to seeing you again at our next meeting, which will be in March. The date will be announced and you'll be able to see that through the um, uh, email blasts that go out as well as on the website. So thank you and have a good evening. <laughs>